Enter the Long Box of the Damned 2024 Bumper Contest, if you dare. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. And welcome to the third part of Event Comics Month 5, Secret Crusade of the Dark Convergence. Today's event, Convergence, is the Dark Horse winner for this Event Comics Month. It's not an infamous event, it's not really awful, but its effects are largely irrelevant, and despite being made to coincide with the 30th anniversary of Crisis on Infinite Earths, it barely has anything to do with it. This is an event where the main miniseries was kind of the most meh part of the whole thing. The tie-ins, on the other hand, were where all the action was. All the things readers wanted to see, and this is one of those times where I actually got quite a few of the tie-ins. Probably the most since Blackest Night. One thing that helps with that is that it was a love letter to the pre-New 52 timeline. As has been documented before, the New 52 was dropped on creative teams very suddenly in last minute. They didn't have a lot of time to resolve storylines and character arcs before the reboot, so this was a chance to give some real finality to these characters. Sure, it wasn't a this is the end of their story kind of thing, but rather, hey, let's have one last adventure with them and have them work through their unresolved issues in a satisfying manner. All the Charlton characters got to hang out one last time. Dick and Barbara shippers got their endgame, while Dick and Starfire shippers also got their endgame. Leanne got brought back to life and a huge middle finger to cry for justice. Superman and Lois Lane get to have their son John. We get to see the Marvel family reunite. United. Wonder Woman gets to fight vampires and lose the people she cared about. Okay, that one was less a resolution. Scratch that. But here's the weirder thing about it as an event comic. The new 52 DC Universe has nothing to do with it! Yeah, all the new 52 heroes are outside the action watching it from afar and being all... Well, I wish we could do something, but can't. Now, that isn't to say that this comes from nowhere. There is a lead-in to this that we'll get into in a second. It's just such a weird thing for an event that it does not actually feature any of the mainline characters as a part of this big thing that's going to be taking over the publishing for a couple months. Convergence is an event whose effects matter so little that the Wikipedia article only covers the plot points of the final issue while spending more time on the tie-ins. So you may be wondering, how does this work if the regular DC heroes weren't involved in this? Well, bear in mind that while the big flex of the New 52 was 52 comic titles as part of the reboot, some of those books didn't last past their eighth issues. However, part of the whole marketing gimmick was those 52 titles, so they were replaced with six new ones to replace the six cancelled books. One of those was Earth 2, a book that simultaneously was a fresh continuity start with a jumping on point, and a book too reliant on past continuity to be new comic reader friendly. The conceit of Earth 2 was an alternate universe tale. Darkseid and Apocalypse made a massive invasion of this Earth, and Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman were all killed in fighting off this invasion. In the wake of all this, a new, or rather revamped, old generation of heroes emerges. Brand new modern versions of the Justice Society would emerge in the present day. Jay Garrick, Alan Scott, etc. All getting their powers for the first time. In the New 52 main time, Timeline, there was no Justice Society or Golden Age of Heroes, so this was their way of trying to revamp the characters instead of letting them go to waste. It was a bit of a mixed bag, but I recall enjoying it when it came out. However, clearly by 2014, the book wasn't working out for people. So they decided to end it and lead into Convergence. This was done both in the final issues of Earth 2 and a bi-weekly series, Earth 2 World's End. It was running simultaneously with the New 52 Future's End. End, which we talked about exhaustively in the 500th episode. The two weekly series were tied together, with Future's End being the possible end result of World's End. In World's End, Darkseid launches a second invasion of Earth, and it's devastating, destroying the planet enough to force what little human population is left to evacuate it. We saw the effect of that evacuation in Future's End, where they ended up overhead of the New 52 universe and merged with their society and all the crap from that. The finale of Future's End undid all that so they'd end up elsewhere. I recall World's End being okay, or at least pretty good. It's been years and years since I read it, and I only skimmed bits here here and there for this review, but I found it to be all right for the most part compared to the eternal headache and destruction of my voice that was Future's End. 
But let's get back to why we're here. In the final battle of World's End, several superheroes were left behind to fight Darkseid and were blasted with his Omega Beams. This included Alan Scott, Jay Garrick, Superman, aka Valzod, one of a few kids who were saved from Krypton's destruction instead of just Kal-El, Batman, aka Thomas Wayne, Bruce's father who was revealed to have survived the attack on their family and had been secretly assassinating the crime family he had connections to before becoming Batman to honor Bruce after he was killed in the original Darkseid invasion. And Richard Grayson, who on Earth 2 was a reporter who married Barbara Gordon and had a son that he let evacuate into one of the escape ships. And these people are our main characters for this event. Not the New 52 heroes, but rather a group of characters from what is essentially a long-running Elseworlds story. As a result, this is kind of the culmination of a long set of stories we haven't really covered before, so there will likely be references to events that occurred in those books, and we probably don't have time to cover them all, seeing as we have eight issues to look at here. Hopefully you can all keep up, and I'll give the more important details when I can. So let's dig into Convergence and see what this story is actually about. Reading from a trade, so no looking at the covers, which are all kind of meh anyway. We open in Gotham City, implied to be the version from the Injustice games and comics. I have never read them or played them, the concept does not appeal to me, so I don't know how accurate this is. An evil Superman is berating the other heroes for rejecting him, but said heroes are also telling him to get his head out of his ass because the city is in ruins from disaster that's still plaguing it. Tectonic upheaval and magma flowing through the streets. What good is being invincible without a city left to lead? Without people to bow, scrape, and kneel to you? Gotham City is all but destroyed. Its citizens dead. You showed up in time to pick over the carcass of a ruin. And it doesn't matter anyway because I called dibs. Whoever is responsible responsible for this destruction calls out to them, saying that they brought this on themselves and have been proven unworthy. As the ground erupts around them, the Injustice Superman flies off, briefly tempted to go save people, but decides against it. Let the destruction be a reminder of the price to be paid by those who turn against. I hope you've all learned your lesson now about how over there needs to take care of its own problems, so get on that! However, the ground forms into a giant hand that rises up and slams him back down into the ruins. The failed experiment. My master was wrong to bring them here. 
I must begin again. Great, I already sunk like a hundred hours into this playthrough, and now I've got to start from scratch. The previously mentioned Earth 2 refugees suddenly find themselves teleported to a desert. Jay Garrick quickly making a clearing for the unpowered ones to land safely in. They're confused about what the hell just happened, since last they recall, Darkseid was shooting them with his Omega Beams. I have some thoughts. Well, don't keep them to yourself, big guy. We're open to some ideas here. I think we were rescued by pixies. Moments ago, the four of us were making a final stand against Apocalypse. With the Earth about to fall, we were transported here. Whether that was Darkseid's plan or some sort of cosmic gratitude, we don't know yet. Either way, we're gonna need a thank you card. Dick Grayson attacks Batman, thinking gratitude is not what they should be looking for right now when everything has gone to hell and his family is gone. But Jay Garrick isn't tolerating any of that crap right now. Not when he's lost family too, and he recognizes Dick as a war correspondent. Who never went near the front lines. But enough about that, there's another survivor who digs her way out of the ground. Yolanda Montez, aka formerly Wildcat for a time, and aka the Red Avatar of Earth. One of the things that the New 52 did was really push stuff that was more in the forefront of Alan Moore's Swamp Thing stories. In particular, concepts like the green. The Green was an extra-dimensional force that connected all plant life together. On Earth 2, Alan Scott's Green Lantern power isn't from a power battery or anything like that, but his connection to the Green of the Earth. And in the wake of the New 52, they introduced other similar beings like the Red, which connected all animal life, with Yolanda as its avatar here. After kissing Grayson, she tells him to stop feeling sorry for himself. Tell that to the people who died. I don't need to tell them anything. I was with them. I was part of them. They were surprisingly sticky. Every avatar gave their life for our world, and being avatar of the red made every death feel like my own. So stop being mad about people dying because I felt people dying and I'm okay with it. They're not on Earth anymore, since Alan Scott can't connect to the green anymore. Superman wants to return to it, still hoping to save it, but the discussion is interrupted by some kind of liquid metal goop coming out of the ground to grab them. A dome starts forming up around the area, which begins dampening their powers, but Superman freezes it before it can finish the job. The figure behind the dome appears. This is Telos, who asks them why they're without their city. Our city was destroyed. We were the only ones left. As far as I can tell, we may not even have a planet anymore. No city? Unacceptable. Here's a copy of SimCity DS until we can get a PC version of it up and running for you. Time for Mr. Stonepants to start answering a few of our- Yolanda, his pants aren't made of stone. They're not even in a color similar to rocks. What? He explains that he was supposed to grab a city of theirs before the planet was destroyed, but instead only got the group of them, a directive set forth by his master, Brainiac. If you'll recall Future's End, it was revealed in that that Brainiac was in fact a multiversal threat and not just from a single dimension. Mind you, in practice, he still just did the same thing, grab a city for preservation, but still. In any case, their group was supposed to be the last city collected. Perhaps this is a sign. The signal my master told me would one day come. Yes, it must be. Because when I think of big alien robot with a massive amount of intelligence and power, the first thing that comes to mind is vague instructions to his minions concerning his grand plan that are easily reinterpreted. He captures them all again in the liquid metal and declares that it's time to decide which city will be replanted in the multiverse. A reborn universe, while the rest will be called. And he'll determine this by having the cities fight each other. A perverse tournament. Eh, at least it'll be shorter than the one I was in. Behold, as I reach out to all that inhabit my world and speak to them as one. Behold, I have an intercom system! Be impressed! So it's not exactly explicit in this comic, but it is so in the tie-ins, so I'll explain it here. All of the cities that were taken are under domes with power dampening abilities that kept the superheroes from escaping. They've been here for a single year and they've been surviving, but just that, with no idea what happened to them until Telos is broadcast. Citizens of my world, I have brought this convergence upon you. Now is the time. The hour is near. Judgment is here. But first, we have some birthdays to read off. Only one city shall survive, only the strong. Since your arrival, I have been the air that you breathe, the water you drink, the toilets you pee in. Please stop doing that. I am the very ground you walk upon. 
I am your starless sky. I am this world. I am Telos. I have tended to your every need. Except for you, Ron, you weirdo! Ugh. But now the domes will fall, and champions must rise. Never have the powerful among you been more necessary, for you are about to partake in the greatest experiment of all. We will know how many licks it takes to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop! Your time has ended. Your worlds are dead. Sorry you all missed the funerals. Apology gift baskets will be delivered to you within the hour. But I have the power to grant one city a future. Unfortunately, he means in the stock market. Some of you came to me at a time of infinite crisis. Others were brought here in the final moments of their zero hour. Whether it was a flashpoint for a time that never was, or of kingdoms that will never come. No doubt the genesis of a blackest night shall fall, causing an identity crisis and an invasion, but while it shall be a dark night that has metal in it, this will be the final night, the final crisis. Armageddon 2001. Yeah, while the reference to Kingdom Come was really only referring to one universe, the tie-in issues were grouped together into different eras of DC. From around Crisis on Infinite Earths, from before that time, from around Zero Hour, and finally from right before Flashpoint. Thus the aforementioned last hurrah of the pre-New 52 universe. You'd have the Stephanie Brown Batgirl teaming up with Cassandra Cain and Tim Drake one last time. A final adventure for the Matrix Supergirl. A heartwarming farewell to Ted Kord and the Justice League International. And and of course, my favorite, the convoluted, nonsensical, but oh-so-satisfying moment of Leanne Harper being rescued from before she died in Cry for Justice and reunited with Roy Harper. But yeah, here we have the other plot point of the tie-ins. Tello says that they are now in competition with each other. Each city has to go to war with the others, defeat the champions of the other city to score a victory until there's one city left. Elseworld Tales, different eras of DC Comics and different versions of beloved heroes, have to duke it out for the chance to survive. Our heroes say this is insane and clearly not what Brainiac intended. No, it is destiny. It is convergence. Witness, it has begun. Oh, wait, it just went to commercial. It will begin in a couple of minutes. Uh, anyone need a snack or anything? That brings us to issue two, which begins with a continuity error, at least in the original single issues, though it got corrected in the trade. There's a flashback to Dick Grayson putting his son Johnny on the evacuation transports from Earth 2, except in the original single issue, he was named Tommy. Convergence had three writers on it, none of whom worked on World's End, so it's an understandable mistake to make, Though I question why they wouldn't be involved in some way with it, when it was the book that directly led into this event! Then again, DC also had Countdown and having it lead into Final Crisis without having Grant Morrison on hand to actually make it properly connect, so at least there's precedent for this. He recalls how he gave his son to a woman on an escape transport, actually an evil Big Barda, but that's neither here nor there, when they wouldn't let him on, but then seeing the ship explode right before the final battle, trying to get over to Batman, and then getting taken to Telos' world, though he swears he's going to find his son. Yolanda forces Dick to wake up, the hero is still all stuck in the liquid metal. What the hell happened to us? Why are my drippings with goo? Yolanda explains that ever since the superheroes got knocked out, Telos has been pairing up cities to fight. Fight. He tries to get the heroes to choose which cities to fight each other, but they obviously refuse. So he picks. First up is a city featuring the horrible Brother Eye cyborgs from Future's End, which already goes to show why this whole thing was dumb to begin with, because why in God's name would you want to preserve anything from Future's End? And the city he'll be putting them up against? This world, born of a great creator, whose time was short-lived, but who moved on to serve his purpose on another planet. Poochie? No, believe it or not, it's the Just Imagine Stan Lee Creates the DC Universe Heroes, who apparently had a great creator in-universe, otherwise Telos knows how to break the fourth wall. And yeah, this might be a fun fight if the Just Imagine Heroes won out over the edge dork grim crap of the Future's End stuff. For God's sakes, they even have Hockey Puck Hawkman here, who is actually a ball? I don't know if that's better or worse, but no, Future's End manages to beat the Stan Lee heroes, which 
kind of feels really disrespectful. Like, it's not gruesome or visceral, thankfully, but you can't help but feel like it's their way of saying, ha ha ha, our garbage weekly event that just wrapped up is superior to this fun Elseworlds concept from several years ago. And just to spoil it, it's not like this was an attempted permanent death. The Just Imagine heroes got their own world in the DC multiverse. It just feels wince-inducing to do it like this is all. Our heroes break free and go on the attack. While Green Lantern doesn't have access to the green anymore, he thinks he can still connect to the life force of the planet. But, as Tello states, he is the planet. So what he's tapped into is dark and weird, and the same power source as his own. Still, he's able to use it to temporarily push Telos' humanoid personification back and give them a chance to breathe. Batman injects himself with something, which Dick Grayson notices. I saw that. It's not what you think. I just take it so the others will think I'm cool. Actually, it's Miraclo, a fictional drug in the DC Universe that can temporarily grant superpowers. Our man of the Justice Society uses it with the restriction that it will only work for one hour every 24 hours. Otherwise, if you use it more, it becomes addictive and harmful. Mind your own business. I'm a doctor. I know what I'm doing. Do you think this gynecology degree means nothing? Telos reforms, reminding them that he's one with the planet and Green Lantern is too weak to try to force him back again. Superman attacks with all his power declaring that Telos has never fought someone with his might before, but Telos just scoffs at that. Still, he feels this isn't worth his time and disintegrates back into the planet. Green Lantern says that while the connection to the planet is somewhat toxic for him, it did give him some access to Telos' mind, sensing a fear he has of something under the surface of a nearby ruined city. Batman says he and Dick are gonna go stop by a nearby Gotham City for some potential allies on the way, while the rest can head for the ruined city. Hopefully rendezvous there in an hour. Batman explains that he took Grayson along for this mostly because of his defense defeatist attitude. He's a liability after he's lost everything in his life and isn't ready for the fight ahead. They walk into Gotham, guarded by robots Telos controls which are designed to keep people from fleeing the cities but not prevent anyone from entering. The two enter into the city's Batcave via the sewers. Batman telling Dick to stay put while he goes to meet this Batman. Dick briefly sees this version of Barbara Gordon on a screen. No, it is. It's not, but it can't be. Barbara? I was frozen. Couldn't speak. What do you say to your dead wife? Well, for starters, honey, I don't think we're going to get the deposit back for your coffin. Alfred emerges and tells Barbara he has the situation in hand, questioning Dick about how he got into the cave. He explains how he was brought here by his Batman, Dr. Thomas Wayne, and Alfred suggests that maybe they should leave father and son alone for a bit. And indeed, we soon see the two encounter each other, and the narration is pretty good. A wounded father and a wounded son meeting from opposite ends of the same path. I wouldn't find out later what they talked about up there, and by then it would be too late. Son, I'm sorry to tell you this, but... I was in a rock and roll band. I have no father! But I like to think that, alone, face to face, and with the air so thick with pain and loss and things too long unsaid, father and son both felt a little peace. I will say that I think VHS tapes are dumb. Oh my god, I know, right? Betamax remains the superior medium. I take it back, I have a father, and he gets me! The other heroes evade some cities battling, only to find the bodies of ordinary civilians who had clearly surrendered, but in turn been executed, most likely by one of the victors. Is that what setting city against city to fight each other turns people into? Whatever we become to survive, we can never forget who we are sworn to protect. Admittedly difficult if we become, like, gophers or something to survive, but not impossible. Look, we've all had a very weird day and I'm not handling it very well, alright? The Batman come down to the cave and give Dick a Kevlar bodysuit so he can have some more protection. Bruce even giving his alternate universe father the Batmobile for faster transport. You've grown into a hell of a man, Bruce. If your father is anything like I am, he'd be very proud. Thanks, but we both know that he'll never be proud of me until I defeat one face. At the ruins, they find another man being chased by Telos' robots and destroy them. The man reveals himself to be a guy named Deimos who says that their arrival was foreseen, and he can help them get off the planet. Ending issue two. Deimos was a character I was not at all familiar with when this comic came out, which honestly worked to the story's benefit for me, since I didn't know what to expect from him. But I should properly introduce you to him, probably because he's a villain, who at one time dressed like this. God damn, dude, you got gams and you want to show them off. 
Deimos was the arch enemy of Warlord, aka Travis Morgan. Warlord was a sword and sorcery comic where a human Air Force pilot found himself in the underground land of Scartarus, a quasi mystical place where time is a bit wonky and their sun never sets. Deimos was originally just a guy who used advanced technology to claim he was a sorcerer, but eventually learned black magic. Also, what the hell is up with his collar? Why is it split into multiple little tendrils? Anyway, issue three. Deimos explains that he comes from a land underground and that they can help take down the demon that holds this world captive. They're attacked by more of Telos' robots and Superman gets captured by them, leading to another example of changes from the single issue to the trade. And I can see why. The other time we've seen was a typo, but this is worse. We have dialogue that seems to be on the wrong pages. We have this shot of a flying Batmobile firing missiles, Superman somehow back with the heroes, and an entire line of dialogue from Telos missing, where he says that all the cities are fighting very well, save for one. The art on these pages will be used again in a few pages down the line, but somehow the pages ended up being doubled and the wrong dialogue put over it. Like, the dialogue balloons themselves are the right ones, even the stems for the balloons are in the same spot. It's like they accidentally copied and pasted some art over another layer below the word balloons, but above the right pages. I don't know how this happens. Or maybe with so many different alternate versions running around, we're just seeing a variant version of these events. Anyway, the bottle city of Kandor, well, less bottled here, refuses to fight and Telos just destroys them because he's kind of an asshole. Anyway, over in the correct pages, Batman and Dick Grayson arrive and save the rest of our heroes, including Superman. Deimos explains that he was imprisoned by Brainiac for a time, and it's only a matter of time before he comes back, that he knows a way to stop him and free them from this world. I sensed something Telos fears. Perhaps it's this typo extra L that he fears. Fixed in the trailer by the way. Man, this issue was sloppy when it was released. Batman says he's gonna stay behind and take care of something while the others proceed down. Dick Grayson saying he'll stay with them. When they leave, Batman explains why he's staying. Something followed them from Gotham, and he wants to buy some time for the others. The heroes arrive at Scartarus, which according to Deimos seems to be mostly invisible to Telos' equipment. Probably somehow accidentally scooped up with the ruined city above them. Deimos says that there's a power in the castle that his opponent wants to claim. A despot who drove him out of it. And we soon see that inside of that castle is friggin' Monarch and the JSA supervillain Per Degaton. Both say they're unable to use their powers because of a dampening field before a woman named Shakira, an ally of Warlord, uses a big robotic claw machine to shove them into a bubble containing other time-traveling heroes and villains. Speaking of heroes and villains, it's revealed that the ones who were following Batman out of Gotham City were a group of Batman's villains. The most recognizable is the Riddler. I'd say the rest are minor villains, but that's up to personal preference. I mean, Professor Pig and Dr. Hurt are certainly big villains to Grant Morrison, since they kept pushing the characters, but whatever. Point is, they managed to overwhelm Batman, promising to kill him and then the other Batman. That's it. Get closer. You'll never hurt another Wayne again. And he detonates a bomb, blowing them all the hell up. If you just read Convergence, the significance of this moment is probably lost on you, but I recall at the time actually being quite moved by this death because I had been reading Earth 2 and following Thomas Wayne around. Admittedly, it's been almost 10 years since then, so I don't know if I reread it, I'd have the same feelings about it, but this was a character death that had been built up. As Dick Grayson explains, Thomas Wayne was trying to make a for all the crap he did in his life and was trying to protect people he cared about, including Dick Grayson himself. I'm also not sure how his body is still intact when he was ground zero for the bomb, but there he is. And then it turns out the Joker was with the villains and he's alive, shooting Dick in the side, which somehow makes him unable to feel his legs? I don't know, maybe it hit his spine, but the angle doesn't look right for that. How does that feel, boy? Knowing that letting me shoot you renders Batman's sacrifice meaningless. It feels like I just got shot in the side and thus any mourning or regrets kind of take second priority right now. However, Telos suddenly appears and snaps the Joker's neck, ending issue three by asking Dick where the others have gone. In every reality and forgotten timeline I have witnessed, Dick Grayson wears a mask. But this Dick Grayson is different. He doesn't wear underpants. Dick Grayson fights to survive to find his son. That's what this convergence is. 
A fight for survival. To hold on to a dwindling comic market that still pissed at us for bad creative choices we made. Tello says the bullet did indeed shatter Dick's spine and is using the liquid metal to grant him mobility and support. He explains that he doesn't want any of the Earth 2 heroes dead. He wants them to join the Convergence to fight for their survival like everyone else. I am not an enemy, Dick Grayson. I could be your god even, but only if you win. If you lose, I'll be more like a local youth pastor for a denomination you don't follow. Both Green Lantern and Yolanda can sense their respective elements within Scartarus, since there's animal and plant life here that should be extinct, but still remains within it. Deimos explains that they're after the Time Masters, people who are the key to saving the planet and returning everyone home. They begin their attack on the castle, and points to Deimos for not losing his temper or anything when Superman says that they're not going to kill anyone, just saying, Oh, don't worry. I'm only saying death to the warlord as an intimidation tactic. Usually this kind of villain can't help but let the mask slip. The warlord himself is busy fighting lizard men, his wife Tara with him, and suspecting that the prophecy foretelling the end of Scartarus is coming true. Back over to Telos and Grayson, they observe the various cities fighting each other, Telos admiring it all. I refined and accelerated the download so, instead of eons, this great experiment in heroism will take days. Wait, eons? Were you expecting the cities to just sit there unchanged for eons before they were gonna fight each other? Grayson tries to tell him it's wrong and to break his programming, save everyone, but Telos refuses. And why would we do that? What would we learn? The strongest will survive. That is the very basic rule of life. There totally aren't any other qualifications or traits that are useful to survival. It's a good thing I was programmed by such a smart robot. Back in Scartarus, Deimos has run off ahead of the heroes, and they fortunately have been suspicious of his intentions, so they send Yolanda off to pursue him. In the castle, Shakira is actually willing to let the Time Masters go, as long as they all agree to fight on Warlord's side. Unfortunately for them, Per Degaton is an arrogant douchebag who refuses to even lie about his allegiance, and just keeps saying no. Back to Grayson and Telos, our hero is finally getting through to the guy. You have to know that all life, all parallel realities, all ideas have value. I'm gonna be honest, I have a lot of respect for Convergence. Not just for the tie-ins giving me some resolution on the pre-New 52 timeline, but because it seems to be a recognition of how wasteful the retcons and reboots are for the DC Universe. Crisis on Infinite Earths was supposed to simplify DC, but as time went on, it just became more and more complex. And especially nowadays, it feels like DC is hitting the reset button every few years. Not full-on ones, but the same kind of THROW EVERY Everything at the wall and connected to the previous crises with the meta reboots themselves being an important aspect of in-universe history mindset. It just makes an already complex web of continuity even more convoluted and confusing. We're gonna see this present next time, and especially if patrons start voting for other events down the road like it. Convergence is admittedly the start of it, but its thematic point is that erasing what came before, trying to say that one version is superior to another is wrong, that there's room for all these versions to exist. And I am inclined to agree with that. To a point, however. DC is still a business. It's the business of making stories, yes, but they can't afford to put out 300 different titles per month covering every single possible permutation of the DC universe. There needs to be a central continuity that we follow, something ongoing that the readers are invested in and can point to stories to bring others in. Otherwise, you run the risk of telling the same stories over and over and over and over. Less a reboot in that case, and more a retreading of the same ground without consequences. Never learning, never moving forward, just going in circles. And maybe a clearing of the deck might be good once in a while, but that's only if what replaces it is just as good or better. And let's face it, people, the New 52 was not an improvement over what came before. Even for the good stories that did come out, the fans who did get into comics because they gave it a shot, the overall reboot was a huge mess. In any case, Grayson tells Telos that he's not just a planet or something programmed, he's sentient and alive and can make his own choices. Telos agrees, but he still feels compelled to follow the programming anyway. Down in Scartarus, Deimos has made his way to the heart of the castle, though he says that he knows Yolanda is following him. He admits he does want Scartarus for his own, but now recognizes that he can have so much more than that now. He offers her a chance to share this power with her, 
but Yolanda, of course, says no to that. Still, he has magic that can easily repel her attacks. He arrives at the space where the Time Masters are contained and confronts Shakira, who apparently also is connected to the Red, but he... kills her? Somehow? Like, I don't see a knife wound or anything, just his eyes glowing? Like he says, black cat of magic. So did he, like, suck the magic out of her? It is more suspenseful when you don't know what's going on. Deimos uses his magic to drain away the power of the Time Masters as the rest of our heroes arrive. Shakira is also apparently alive, but knocked out, which, again, I couldn't tell from what happened. Anyway, yeah, they confront Deimos as he continues to drain the power. I can see all your timelines now, Jay Garrick. You were the first to encounter a breach in the multiverse in a life long ago. I mean, technically that was Barry Allen who encountered it and went to Jay's Earth. Or do you mean how Jay Garrick's adventures somehow got psychically transmitted to a comic creator? You are the original Heroes Reborn. The first, and now the last. Especially this guy, whoever the hell he is. Warlord and Terra are blocked from returning to the castle by a force field and have to go to the dark tunnels to try to get in, but let's get back to our heroes. Telos and Grayson teleport into the area, finally locating them, but Deimos is happy he's there. He says he has a bargain to offer Telos, using the power of the Time Masters, to reveal Brainiac, who's currently imprisoned inside a giant T-sphere from the events of Future's End. Deimos, what do you want? Free me and you shall have it. First, a lifetime supply of starch for my weird collar thing! That brings us to issue 5, with Dick Grayson returning to narration duties. I'm told in other realities I'm more like Batman, and I can't help but wonder if I were more like Batman, would I still have my son at my side? Oh, definitely! Along with six or seven other orphans you adopted along the way. Grayson thinks there's something more at play with the Convergence than just trying to find the strongest reality. Some long game that they're not seeing, but that's neither here nor there at the moment. Deimo says that thanks to his power, he knows the truth about Telos. That he was not a planet granted sentience by Brainiac, but rather he was once a human with a family who was recruited by Brainiac in exchange for saving his people and sending them far away from all this. Telos is horrified by all this and Grayson realizes that this is what they need. He's just like them, the last survivor of his world, and consequently may be inclined to help them. While Warlord and Terra are attacked by lizard men again, with Terra mortally wounded, Brainiac keeps demanding to be released and to erase Telos' mind of what he just learned. The distraction allows that one dude who is part of the group, actually a Warlord supporting character named Machiste, to try and attack Deimos. But Deimos is too powerful, easily killing him by ripping out his heart, telling the other heroes that this is an example of what will happen if they oppose him. But I can see the the future. You will stand against me, and you will die for it. So this is actually a pretty bad example for you guys, huh? Uh, anyone need a spare heart? Grayson informs the others that Batman is dead, Deimos lowering the force field to invite them to try to fight him, and they do so! Superman says that Deimos' magic might hurt him, but it won't stop him. I have seen the future, Superman, and it will. Lois and Clark together again. The Titans hunted, reunited. What is it I see? Some good stories coming out of this? No, it can't be. While Warlord has to leave Terra behind, promising to return with help, Deimos is able to take down Jay and Superman. They consider freeing Brainiac in the hopes of stopping him, but Deimos makes that moot by using his powers to banish him somewhere. And then Warlord charges in, riding on a Triceratops. Gotta admit, even without the meta stuff concerning realities and reboots and multiverse stuff, this would still be the best event we talked about for this month for that image alone. I want to paint this on the side of a van. Unfortunately, this badass entrance is made entirely moot by Deimos just using his magic to rapidly age Warlord into dust. If you're wondering why I kept bringing up Warlord's slow return to this point, all those cutaways, it was to show how much it was completely pointless padding within the story, too. 
Good job wasting our time, event comic. The castle starts to collapse because of reasons, and Yolanda somehow gets separated from the others who flee. Once outside, they can't find Yolanda or even her body. Jay stays behind to look for her, and Telos, who also went missing, telling the others to try to get to the cities and hopefully organize them. Grayson stays behind to grab a batarang that just happened to be there, and uses it to paint the bat symbol on his suit. Maybe Telos was right. Maybe there is always going to be a tie between Dick Grayson and Batman. Maybe it's time that tie got stronger. What I'm trying to say is, yes, Batman, I will marry you. Deimos brings Yolanda to Brainiac's occupation chamber, where his collar now appears to resemble some kind of bone armor? If that's what was always the intention with it, man, they dropped the ball on drawing it like that. You don't know it, Yolanda, but you were there during the first Nexus event. The first Convergence. The Crisis. You didn't actually play a big part in it, but you took over for Wildcat in that one scene that made it into the event. I don't think Linkara talked about that in his review. Yolanda says that her friends will stop him. Why did Deimos save her anyway? And he says they plan on uniting the cities against him. But instead, he says he'll be uniting them for him. Using the chamber, he contacts all the cities just as Telos had done. Citizens of Telos! There is no more need to fight. We're calling it a draw, and you're all getting the consolation prize of a $1,000 Walmart shopping spree. But no, he says that he's defeated Telos and saved all their lives. They'll even get to have a place in his new reality. But only if they serve him, bringing us to issue 6. As I said in the intro to this video, the new 52 heroes are not actually involved in these events, but they are watching it from a distance. We open with a bunch of new 52 heroes observing the planet Telos seeming to emerge into their universe because of reasons. And hey look, there's Blue Beetle! Good to see that Jaime made it back home after that god-awful Threshold miniseries. But yeah, the heroes, the guardians of the universe, Darkseid, even Nick's friggin' Wotan from Final Crisis are all observing this go down and being like, well, we don't know what's happening, but let's hope that whoever is down there knows what they're doing. It's just fascinating to behold. People wondered what the recurring theme of this event comics month was. You could say all the events are sequels, or that all the events had important stuff happening in the tie-ins, but... Here we are, three for three now, where the events barely feature the actual heroes of their respective universes! Given some of the events that occur in the final event, you could probably argue it's four for four, but yeah. Convergence is the most interesting for this. Secret Wars 2 and Infinity War still had the heroes playing parts, even if they were ultimately not the main characters of it. But here we've got a book all about alternate versions of these characters taking the forefront while everybody else just sits back and watches. It's an event where all of the mainline books are so not appearing in this film. Anyway, Deimos reiterates his ultimatum. Pledge their loyalty to him and survive, or refuse and be destroyed, giving them one hour to decide. Deimos wonders why so many iterations of Yolanda's friends echo across the multiverse, but enough of that since we're not getting an answer there. Yolanda wonders why he wants to rule them, but Deimos says he doesn't. He knows he can't control all these people, so instead he's planning on leading them to their deaths to power his magic and build a new universe altogether. Our heroes run into a bunch of pre-New 52 heroes, including the Titans, Superman, and the Wally West Flash fighting the supervillains known as the Extremists. Fortunately, so many heroes make them retreat, and the Flashes realize Hey, if there are more of us, maybe we'll all be willing to work together to stop Deimos. The Flashes are right. This is an opportunity. For what, Superman? I mean, the Superman I don't know? Oh, oh god, this is confusing. Stephanie Brown, if you think it's confusing now, just give it a few years. You are one of at least three Batgirls running around. Oh, and while I say these are the pre-New 52 versions, I should point out that, like, it is technically alternate versions of them, since obviously when Flashpoint happened, time altered, and so pre-New 52 became New 52. With one exception. Superman. Yeah, I'm not kidding about the confusion here. The Superman here is the pre-New 52 Superman. He survived Flashpoint along with Lois Lane, and that led to them having a kid, then migrating into the New 52 universe, and somehow his history got mixed with the New 52 Superman, and then... I need to bring back the continuity alarm. This is way too convoluted for anyone to care. 
Anyway, the heroes, save for Clark, Superman, and Dick Grayson, split up to go inform the other cities of what's going on and bring everyone together. He explains that he's actually been able to hear everything that's happened on this planet since they got here. Thus, he's overheard all the conversations with Telos. If you're wondering why he didn't come help, he was involved in tie-in shenanigans involving the birth of his son, so I think he made the right call there. And says that Dick Grayson may be the most important player here. He's the one who's been able to get through to Telos, and they're gonna need his help to take on Deimos. What am I supposed to say? If you're anything like the Dick Grayson I know, I trust you'll figure it out. Just punch him in the face with your magical fist of morality and rant at everyone to keep their masks on in a hospital. That's what my Dick Grayson did. Jay Garrick runs into another Flash, specifically Barry Allen. Even more specifically, the Barry Allen Flash from right before he died destroying the Anti-Monitor's canon. It's one of the ways this book was in some ways acting as an anniversary for Crisis on Infinite Earths. It's not super overt about it like Infinite Crisis was, but it's kind of neat in that regard. Anyway, Dick Grayson realizes that since Telos is the planet, he can hear from anywhere and so has him reform in... like... Super Stonehenge? I don't know what this place is. Dick explains that he knows what Telos is going through, learning about how he lost his family and all. Telos reforms. I was human like you, Dick Grayson. Then Brainiac erased my mind. He programmed me. And he did it in, like, COBOL. Who the hell still uses COBOL? He ordered me to do such horrible things to the people he brought here. And with him gone, I have no answers. No way to know where he sent my family and my people. I have nothing. I barely even feel the loss. I spent, like, my whole weekend on this, damn it! But nah, Dick says that they have a chance to make up for the mistakes they made. Hell, if they can retrieve the power stolen by Deimos, maybe he can find out his true name and all. Deimos, who is now just floating above the ground because shut up, waits for the gathered heroes to show up to fight him. However, he reveals that while the heroes were unwilling to serve him, a good chunk of supervillains were. Mind you, I think the writers may have misremembered some of the Elseworld stories. Like, Kingdom Come, Superman and Wonder Woman? What? Hell, I think this is supposed to be the Kingdom Come Captain Marvel, who I could kind of see, but his dialogue seems wrong. I'd like to think this is actually Superman Distant Fires Captain Marvel. Anyway, next issue! Back with the New 52 characters and their important job of standing around doing nothing, one of the figures who's observing all this is the Oracle. Not Barbara Gordon, of course, but a cosmic entity with a pretty neat design. Why can I not see your futures? Or mine? Is there no future? Or one simply without me? Well, I had to look you up to figure out who the hell you were, and I don't recall seeing you since, so... Probably one without you. Sorry, man. New 52 Superman saves some of Stormwatch and retreats to a space station where all the heroes are observing this, including Guy Gardner and his red lanterns. Enough lantern, Gardner! Why do we stay with these humans? And why are you in a green lantern uniform in this panel when you were in a red one last issue? Art mistake, dude! They fixed it in the trade! Back on Telos the planet, big fight scene! It lasts for a couple pages, but then Telos arrives, using his liquid metal to restrain the villains following Deimos. However, Deimos counterattacks. The power of death is already circulating through my veins, Telos! The power of hatred, desperation, envy! And with their powers combined, I am... Captain Douchebag! Another player enters the picture for the good guys, but not a good guy himself. As I said, the cities were taken from various points in DC history, including from around Zero Hour, which means we've got Hal Jordan Parallax who decides to step in. Deimos, a word. You dare? Of course I dare. I'm Hal Jordan. Look, as someone who's already been a villain for an event comic celebrating a decade anniversary for the original Crisis, you're doing this all wrong, man! Deimos forces him back, and Grayson asks Yolanda if she's figured out any weakness Deimos might have, and she reveals his plan to kill them all and use their deaths for his own purposes. The villains overhear this and instantly believe her, so they decide to join up and take him on too. Unfortunately, they can't get close to him because of the energy he's putting out. Only Telos can survive it. Telos 
gets his second wind and presses the attack, trying to restrain him as best as he can. But Deimos in turn keeps on unleashing his power too. Fortunately, Parallax is more than happy to blast him and vaporize him. You're the worst kind of villain, Deimos. One obsessed with power for power's sake. You didn't even get a cool shot of you wearing a bunch of power rings and smiling maniacally. God, you are so lame! You wield it for your own selfish needs. Power like that can not only save lives, it can revive them. My universe. My world. My coast city. You bore me. God, can we call a do-over on this event? Just make me the villain again! Unfortunately, true to form for Hal Jordan Parallax, he screwed up by destroying Deimos. He still had all that power from the Time Travelers. He apparently had absolute control over all of time, he just didn't realize it yet. And now that power is unleashed. The Oracle is destroyed from the release of power, telling the New 52 Superman and Supergirl that all of reality is now breaking apart to end Issue 7. Dr. Fate, apparently having been here this whole time, examines the remains and the burning energy from Deimos' destruction and explains what's up. Apparently because the planet Telos exists outside the multiverse, the unleashed energy is going to travel into the core of the planet, blow it up, and it will cause a chain reaction that'll destroy the multiverse. Of course! Don't you know anything about science? God, do you think Superman at Earth's end is on this planet too? Or did Brainiac decide it wasn't worth saving a city from there? Anyway, Parallax claims that he can save them all, but of course the pre-New 52 heroes know he's full of it. I know what's best for everyone, Diana. If you did, you would have rendered Deimos unconscious rather than kill him. Okay, but to be fair, I don't really think that Parallax's energy beams have a stun setting. Tello says that while Deimos destroyed a bunch of those time travelers before, he didn't get all of them, and the rest are on their way. And they soon arrive! And this one's another doozy! It's Booster Gold, his sister Gold Star, and Wave Rider. To be accurate, this is the New 52 Booster Gold, the pre-New 52 Gold Star, and Wave Rider Rider is actually the pre-New 52 Booster Gold who turned into Wave Rider because of his tie-in issues. More on that in a bit. Point is, they can't absorb the temporal energy themselves, but they know someone who can. Brainiac, who they retrieve from wherever Deimos sent him. They free him, Brainiac more than happy to destroy them all, but Clark Superman tells him to knock it off. And then what, Brainiac? You'll be destroyed along with the rest of reality! I thought you were the most intelligent being in the universe! I'm laughing at the superior intellect. Brainiac admits he wanted to be the smartest in the multiverse, but that clearly things have gotten out of hand and he's not what he once was. He admits to being the Brainiac from before the New 52, having escaped into the multiverse after Flashpoint to try to gain more knowledge, observing the various iterations of himself. To evolve as the monitors had. So he wanted to be a bunch of jackasses standing around going, WE SHOULD DO SOMETHING! Should we do something? Yeah, that sounds right. But I was caught in a storm caused by a boy. Radiac was better in my universe! And lost in a tear in reality created by a monster. Although at least it was a better weekly series than Future's End. He re-emerged in the New 52 Earth, mutated into the form he has now. And frankly, he's sick of this crap too and wants to go back to the way he was. I love how cosmic horror, multiversal Lovecraftian Brainiac took all of like a year before even he was sick of being that and wants to go back to the way he was too. He asks for their help, which Dick is disinclined to give, but Telos tells him not to lose his compassion now, since that's what got him to stop being an asshole as well. As the new 52 Superman and Supergirl observe the planet nearby, Brainiac severs Telos' tie to the planet and connects it to himself channeling the temporal energy to return all the various cities and their denizens back to their own universes, saying it's the only way to reset the multiverse. The Earth 2 heroes want to return to their reality as well, but Brainiac encounters a problem. Apparently somehow, the first crisis is too strong and is blocking him from returning everyone to their own realities. He says that they need to change it or else no one gets home. The pre-crisis Barry Allen and Supergirl know their fates and are happy to go back and meet their deaths, 
But that's not enough. They have to change the outcome of Crisis on Infinite Earths. Prevent the multiverse from ever being destroyed. And as such, they're not going back alone. Pre-New 52 Superman, his family, and Parallax are all going back as well. I will admit that's actually kind of a nice parallel to the original Crisis. Instead of Alex Luthor rescuing a hero later turned villain, Superman and Lois, a Superman and Lois are going along with a hero turned villain back into the event. Don't know if that was intentional or not, but nice regardless. So yeah, they all head out, and it's done, apparently. Brainiac informs them that the multiverse is restored again. Each world has evolved, but they all still exist. Including that really weird reality where everything is the same, but every kind of underwear are called panties. Brainiac is pulled back to his own reality, saying that the planet Telos needs to be cleansed, but Telos, the person, points out, Wait, what about the Earth 2 heroes? I have the knowledge they existed. That is all that matters. Lest we forget that Brainiac is still a villain and an asshole, I guess. The area is engulfed in winds and destruction, which probably pushed that word balloon stem to the wrong person, and nope, wasn't fixed in the trade. And the group are engulfed by it for only a moment. With Brainiac disconnected from the planet, Alan Scott is able to link himself to it, revealing that this place did still have the green, but that Brainiac was suppressing it, allowing plant life to rapidly grow on it. What's more, Jay Garrick can feel that the vibrational frequency of the planet has changed, shifting it back to the Earth-2 universe and where Earth was. They have Telos to thank for this as his face appears in the sky. The planet is, for all intents and purposes, the new Earth-2. That series only had one season, but we're going to try to reboot it. I am free, Dick Grayson. And I thank you for that. Hey, Dick, check it out. You must avenge my death, Simba. Tello says his memory has been unlocked and he's heading out to find his family. What's more, Alan Scott picks up a distress call in space from the escape ships of Earth 2, particularly the ones who had been diverted back here after Future's End. And so our comic ends with Green Lantern contacting the ships, telling them to follow the light and that they have a world to rebuild. Dick Grayson's son happily declaring that he knows his dad is there too. This comic is not bad, but it really needed another draft. As I've said before, most of the fun of Convergence is in the tie-ins, but the bones of the miniseries itself aren't bad at all. Telos is programming to make the cities fight for reasons he doesn't quite know, and we never get much of a satisfying answer since Brainiac isn't really concerned with that when we encounter him. Having Deimos come in to usurp the power and force the cities to unite against him, having to alter the events of the original Crisis to save the multiverse, convincing Telos to switch sides via Dick Grayson's humanity, and the hopeful ending for the Earth 2 heroes. It's all good stuff. Stuff, but the problem really just comes down to the script just not being that great. It's not some god-awful, groan-worthy slog of bad lines and poor pacing, but there's nothing that exciting in it. The plot points are there, but the execution of them just lacks a lot of punch. Deimos is an unexpected villain, since the Warlord and Scarterist stuff are more of a niche part of the DC Universe, so there's room to work with it and make it interesting... But Warlord himself just gets killed unceremoniously. Deimos doesn't really have a reason to save Yolanda unless he just finds her hot or something. And the ending fight with him isn't even that fun or long of a slugfest. It's good to have Parallax in there for the Zero Hour connection, but no real Infinite Crisis connection for its part of the anniversary stuff. And while the idea of traveling back to undo the original Crisis is a cool idea, it feels like something they tacked on at the end because they remembered at the last second that this was the 30th anniversary to Crisis on Infinite Earths. I'll grant it this, though. Somehow, DC did a better Secret Wars 2 than Marvel's actual Secret Wars 2. Think about it. The original Secret Wars was just about a powerful being bringing heroes and villains together to fight it out. Secret Wars 2 was poorly titled because there were no Secret Wars, just the Beyonder wandering around trying to find meaning. Instead, here we have a powerful being bringing various heroes and villains from DC's history to the same place and forcing them to fight for survival. That's a cool premise for a Secret Wars story and a celebration of the long history of the company, including alternate universes, alternate timelines, different iterations of characters from across the years to reflect on how they've changed or evolved, 
It's why the premise is kind of fun. And what about the effects on this story, particularly with the ending revelation of the original Crisis being undone, meaning the original version of the multiverse survived? Big fat load of nothing came from that! In fact, despite DC at the time saying that their operational attitude from it was, well, now we can tell any story, anywhere, and any way, they just continued on as before, but dropping the new 52 branding and then leading into the DC Rebirth initiative, which was their way of reintegrating most of the pre-New 52 stuff back in. The idea of the original multiverse being restored was completely ignored afterwards. Every time we see the multiverse after the story, it still remained the 52 different Earths thing. As far as I know, the Booster Gold becomes Wave Rider thing is never addressed again, and we haven't seen Wave Rider since. When DC Rebirth happened, Booster Gold seemed to be back to his old self, save for what happened in Heroes in Crisis, but we've already covered that mess. And yet this event did still happen. The Parallax from this story ended up fighting the Green lanterns in the main book, having survived everything that happened. As I said, the pre-New 52 Superman became integrated into the New 52 Earth along with Lois and their son, who's still around in DC today. Our heroes here got themselves a new book, Earth 2 Society, that dealt with rebuilding civilization after everything that happened that lasted for a couple of years. Telos would get his own very brief ongoing series that would reveal he was actually an old, obscure DC character named Arek Son of Thunder, but I don't think anyone really cared about that, because I only learned that while doing research for this. Otherwise, that whole attempt to undo Crisis, as far as I know, never mentioned again and completely forgotten. Still, for the story we got, this wasn't bad on its own, just that it needed more to be great. But I'd still recommend checking out the tie-ins for a bunch of fun two-part adventures for a lot of DC characters. Next time, we close out Event Comics Month 5 with, as I've been saying, Dark Knight's Death Metal. And we'll see how much more confusing we can make things. And it's gone, Superman. It is. It blinked out away from our universe. But I have a feeling we'll see it again. As far as I know, they never see these heroes or that planet ever again. Your feelings are wrong, Supes. Hello, my friends. Please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon, buy merch from the store envy link in the description, or check out the t-shirts available from Teespring. Thanks for watching.